Fora TV. The world is thinking. The Allowed Business Forum is an extension of our award-winning evening program that's been around for 15 years. Here in the morning, we feature prominent business leaders, big thinkers and authors, especially focusing on leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurship. With the Business Forum, we strive to feature timely and compelling speakers and give the business community an ideal place to get together and a great venue for that marketplace of ideas. What I'm saying basically is it's good for business, so please come to the library. My name is Ted Haptegaber. I'm Director of Corporate Relations at the Library Foundation. What we do is raise funds to benefit the Los Angeles Public Library. If you're already a donor or an associate, um, we appreciate that. If you're not, please stop by our table as you leave and learn more about the foundation. Uh, of all the investments out there, the ROI uh, on investing in a public library has impact citywide and um, is of great value. And especially in this current economic climate, the demand for library services is greater than ever. Many of you walk through around the library every day, so we hope this forum is a good place to come in and visit. To learn more about us, visit our table outside. I want to say a special thanks to Wachovia, our presenting sponsor, for sharing our vision and investing in this initiative and making the Allowed Business Forum possible. <laughs> Many thanks also to KPMG and the law firm Aaron Fox, who are season-long sponsors. Thanks this morning to our breakfast sponsors, that is the UCLA Anderson School, the Harold and Pauline Price Center for Entrepreneurial Studies, and the Step Up Women's Network. A warm welcome to all of you. At the end of the program, you may purchase Linda's book, and she'll gladly sign them in the lobby. Uh, it is also a pleasure this morning to welcome Lisa Napoli. Lisa is our interlocutor for this morning. Lisa is a proud resident of downtown Los Angeles. She relocated to Los Angeles to take a position at Marketplace, got rid of all of her, all of her books, and uses the library on a regular basis, <laughs> and has no fines. <laughs> She's a former host and reporter of the public radio show Marketplace and has worked for MSNBC and the New York Times, where she covered the internet boom and bust. She's currently just returned from Bhutan, um, a country in the Himalayan kingdom, where she helped start the first private radio station. She has a book based on that story coming out next year. To introduce our featured speaker, please welcome Deborah Albin Riley, a partner at Aaron Fox a season-long sponsor of our business forum and a member of the Library Board of Directors, Library Foundation Board of Directors, Deborah. Thank you, Ted. I also want to thank all of the sponsors that make the Allowed Business Forum possible. I am pleased to be here today to represent Errant Fox LLP, a national general practice law firm with offices in New York, Washington, D.C., and New Roots in Los Angeles. Our firm's philosophy is simple. We are dedicated to offering the best legal service delivered by people you relate to as well as respect. We recognize that to be a valued and trusted partner, we must play an active role in the growth of our community and our clients' businesses. Our commitment to community and public service started with one of our founding partners, Albert E. Arendt, over 60 years ago. And we continue his important work here today through our partnership with the Los Angeles Library Foundation and as a sponsor of the Allowed Business Forum. We are indeed thrilled to have one of the best marketing minds in American business with us today. I'm honored to introduce Linda Resnick this morning. What did the Franklin Mint, Fiji Water, Teleflora, and Palm Wonderful have in common? They all have the marketing touch of Linda Resnick. A few quotes to set the stage for our business forum with Linda. Michael Pollan, author of In Defense of Food, says, who else, after all, could have rebranded and relaunched a food as troublesome as the pomegranate, <laughs> a fruit formerly more trouble to eat than it was worth? <laughs> Gloria Steinem says, Linda Resnick is to branding what Warren Buffett is to investing, a master of honesty, common sense, and a belief that one can do well while doing good. And Rupert Murdoch adds, she has had a remarkable career taking small businesses and transforming them into iconic brands. 
That career began at the age of 19 when she founded a full-service advertising agency. Successfully running this business so early in her career enabled her to gain invaluable and practical marketing experience, which, coupled with her entrepreneurial instincts, has been the hallmark of her 40-year career. She has been dubbed the Palm Queen for the success of the Palm Wonderful brand. In 2003, only 12% of the population even knew what a pomegranate was. Today, pomegranates are ubiquitous in our culture, and their health benefits are well known. Palm Wonderful is not only a company that farms, markets, and sells fresh pomegranates, it also produces and markets Palm Wonderful pomegranate juice and palm tea. Linda and her husband, Stuart, also own Paramount Farms and Paramount Citrus Companies, making them the largest farmers of tree crops in the United States, with the nation's largest orchards and processing plants for citrus, almonds, and pistachios. Linda continues to create and build successful brands for their crops, which includes the healthy pistachio, pistachio, why do I say that? Pistachio, how do you say that word? <laughs> Uh, I'll let Linda tell you. Uh, everybody's nuts. The company's growing global brand, Wonderful Pistachios, Pistachios, and Cutie's brand, Mandarin Oranges. After acquiring Fiji Water in early 2005, Linda quickly orchestrated a brand identity relaunch focused on communicating the unique advantages of artesian water. With marketing initiatives that were as differentiating as the brand itself, and despite the fact that the bottled water industry is extremely crowded, Fiji water is now the largest imported bottled water in the United States. In 2007, Linda anticipated growing consumer desire to support companies who are not only environmentally conscious, but are responsive and take meaningful action to address pressing environmental issues like climate change. She led the development of Fiji Green, a multifaceted sustainability program that makes Fiji water the first carbon negative be beverage product in the world. In 1979, the Resnicks purchased a fledgling floral wire service called Teleflora. Linda left advertising and brought her skills to that enterprise as executive pr vice president of marketing. In 1980, her idea of pairing fresh flowers with a well-designed keepsake container turned ordinary flowers into a reminder of something more lasting. Flowers in a Gift earned her one of the advertising's highest accolades, a gold Effie Award. She transformed the company from an ordinary wire service to a technology-driven business. Teleflower is, uh, Teleflora is now the world's largest floral service and floral products company with 20,000 member retail florists. The Resnicks are the former owners of the Franklin Mint, the world's largest marketer of fine quality collectibles. From 1985 to 2000, Linda directed worldwide marketing efforts, created, creating one unique product line after another. She introduced milestone products to the collectible industry like Precision Diecast Cars, the $500 Monopoly set, high-end collector dolls, and a line of Star Trek keepsakes. Linda is Vice Chairman of LACMA's Board of Trustees. She's on the Executive Board of the Aspen Institute, on the Executive Board for the UCLA Medical Sciences, CAP Cure, and the Milken Family Foundation. She's also a trustee of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Welcome to both of you, and thank you for being part of the Allowed Business Forum. Lisa, take it from here. I'm exhausted just hearing I all know. of that. I know. I'm exhausted. <laughs> and you're a farmer, too. That's what's so funny. Yeah, it's incredible. So I, I'm told we have 40 minutes, so okay. I'm going to use my snazzy new I have all the iPhone. time in the world for this great group. No, we can keep going. I don't know. They might kick us out. But we'll give us, okay. I'll, I'll give us 40 minutes. The crickets will chime, and then we'll take some questions from everybody who's made their way out to see you this morning. Yes, Thanks thank to everybody for coming. This is really great. And I do use the library every day. That wasn't made up. And I did give away all my books. I only buy books by people who I know. And I give money to the library. So if Yay. you want to learn from that lesson, that's my unsolicited plug for the library. Um,
I think the other reason they asked me to come here today, Linda, is because at Marketplace we get stacks and stacks of business books, and not very many of them are very good. But yours was an absolutely pleasant surprise because not only does it sort of be a be, serve as a brain drain or of your experience, a sort of biography of your work life, but it serves as a, a biography of your personal life too. And I think especially for women in the audience who work or aspire to work, because I know we have some young people here, it's very exciting to see how you've woven those stories together. So the first thing I wanted to ask you this morning was what is it like to work so closely with your life partner in business? And did you know when he was wooing you um, <laughs> that you were going to end up being both business partners and, and love interests too? Um, well, we met because I had an advertising agency and I was pitching his account, so to speak. He didn't give me the account, but he sure gave me the business. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it is something I suggest you do not try at home, all right? We've been happily married for 36 years. It's a great marriage. Thank you. Five children, four grandchildren. Um, but it is, it's stressful. It really is. And we are so different, which is the good part. I always say, together we make one perfect person separately. It's not so great. So he's very strong in... Um, in uh, law and uh, financial things, and I'm the marketing and creative one. So like I tell the people that work for me, when Stuart says no to an idea, it means maybe. And when I say yes, let's do it tomorrow, it also means maybe. <laughs> so that'll give you some insight to us. So let's go back to when you, even before you pitched Stuart the business, your father was a very successful man. He produced The Blob, which yes. I thought was fantastic. Anybody ever see The Blob? I want to have a screening at your house and see it in your presence. That would be very exciting. Yeah. So, so your father produced The Blob. He was very successful, didn't spare any expense, but he wouldn't send you to art school. You wanted to be, when you were first starting out, an artist. Let's yes. talk about how that sort of steered you onto the path of starting your own business. It kind of forced you into thinking creatively about your life choices. Yeah. Um, I stopped making plans after that. That was the last plan I had was to go to art school. Um, I'd studied art at a very progressive school on the East Coast. I went to high school. It was a public high school, but I painted all day. And my math skills are terrible. So um, I didn't really have the credentials to get into a proper school because I thought I was going to go to art school. But in the end, my father wouldn't send me. And, of course, my brother went to SC. But I'm not going to cry because my life turned out okay. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, I, I decided I would go to Santa Monica City College, and that is a very nice little school, but it just wasn't challenging enough for me. I felt like I was in a high school with ashtrays. You actually could smoke in class in those days. <laughs> uh, that'll tell you how old I am. So um, what happened is that I went to work, and um, the first job I had was at a uh, little dress shop. It was the year, uh, it was the summer between high school and college. And uh, everything I sold came back. I mean, I was very good at selling, but the people would look at themselves in the clothes when they got home, and their husband would say, who sold you that? <laughs> and so, but I said, look, your business isn't doing well. Let me do some ads for you. I had no idea how to do an ad, but I had a cute cartoon style. And um, the salesman from all the local press taught me how to set type and do an ad, and it started bringing in business, believe it or not, when I was like 17. And so then I decided that that's what I would try and do. And I looked for a job in an ad agency, and no one would hire me, so I opened my own little shop. It was called Linda Limited. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. And, um, and I had two kids before I realized how it was happening, and uh, that was a different husband. And I was uh, divorced with two children by the time I was like 24, so... So you had to make your way, or you did. did, you chose to make your way, and you very inventively took a passion of yours, which was art, and yes. morphed it into a way to feed yourself, which is kind of cool, everybody, right? I mean, that's a pretty amazing thing. But the truth is, I wouldn't have been that great an artist, I have to tell you, between you and me. Um, I mean, I was okay, you know, but I wasn't, I wasn't a genius in any way, shape, or form, and business is a much better place for me, so just remember, one door closes, another door opens, that's the way life is.
Well, and you got to be a patron of the arts, which we'll talk about yes. later, which is probably as or more gratifying in many yes, ways. Yes, it is. I want to talk a little bit about, let's talk about the three core businesses right now, and then, or the three most famous businesses right now. Let's talk about the pomegranate, which you practically invented, as we heard in the introduction. <laughs> you, you very artfully took this grove of pomegranates and turned it into an enormous business. Let's talk about how you looked at this. Stuart challenged you to sort of sit in on, on this and figure out how to, how to make it happen, and you did. Yeah, I, I was busy. Uh, he was in love with the pomegranate. We, we bought um, some pistachio growing land in the San Joaquin Valley, and serendipitously, uh, there were 120 acres of pomegranates growing in that parcel of land. And uh, the farmer said, let's pull them. Stewart said, ah, let's see how they do. This is 1986. So um, they did well. And uh, we became enamored with the history and lore of the pomegranate. Uh, King Tut took a pomegranate vase into the afterlife. And uh, the Greeks and the Romans just believed that the pomegranate had all these secrets to longevity. Um, Discordes and Pliny the Elder and so forth. Uh, Catherine de Aragon is one of the only wives of Henry VIII that ended up with her head intact. And her symbol is the pomegranate. Talk about preventive medicine, that really helped her. <laughs> uh, and so forth. And, and Isabella, that troublemaker that started the Inquisition, she also had a pomegranate as her symbol. So it, it's throughout history and throughout art. So we wanted to see if there was anything... Uh, in truth about this. So we went to Michael Aviram, who is the guy that did the seminal research on red wine at Technion University, and he started testing the pomegranate for polyphenols and found that it was really off the charts compared to anything else he had ever tested. So you were looking for a way to sort of justify or, or use this pomegranate well, we, we only had 120 acres, and we have 200 square miles of other crops. So we were just interested, and we had a family doctor whose wife was from Italy, and she knew so much about the pomegranate history. We just wanted to see if there was any truth to it. It was kind of a lark. Let's see. Oh, my God. Then he tested it on 14 people with carotid artery, and it reduced the plaque in their artery. We went, whoa. So we started planting more pomegranates, and we started uh, doing more research, and the research came back and it was pretty amazing. And um, by the time we had 6,000 acres, there was a decision that we should make the pomegranates into a juice. We also sell them fresh. We should make it into a juice because people can't eat two and a half pomegranates a day. Who has that many raincoats, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, we, um, I went to a marketing meeting. That was the first time I actually went to a meeting to discuss it. Because I was busy, I had just done almond accents and a few other food things for uh, some of our other brands. And um, the guys were going to mix the pomegranate juice with filler juices like apple and grape and put it on the shelf stable aisle of the supermarket with uh, cranberry juice cocktail. And uh, so they presented all this stuff and they mixed it with watermelon. And, ugh, it was horrible. So... Um, I sat there and tried to behave myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, Stuart said, well, what do you think? When they were finished with the presentation, I, th I said, I think you're crazy. Why would you water down something as brilliant as this? This is what you should do. And I wrote down P heart M, which was divine inspiration. I swear I had nothing to do with it. it was, my hand was like an Ouija board. I said, this is the name of the product. And I said, you should put it in a fabulous bottle and you should sell it in the produce section, refrigerated, because obviously you can't sell it in shelf stable. It'll go bad. It's a living thing, like wine, you know. And so uh, he said, all right, well, that sounds like a good plan. Take over the company. <laughs> and I did. And then, and then I did the research study and found that nobody knew what a pomegranate was. It was like, what do I do now? Well... We but, figured it out. But what you did was so interesting, how you convinced us all that the pomegranate was kind of a sexy thing and also a healthy thing is an interesting story, too. And it sort of sums up all your philosophies about marketing, too. It does, it does. It's sort of the essence of it. One of the things I'll tell you in the book is that in order to market a brand, a product, a service, or even you as a brand, you have to find the intrinsic value in what you do. And that isn't selling it for a cheap price. Value means price to a lot of people, but believe me, that's not a marketing strategy. 
Uh, we're the Anderson people. Oh, thank you for coming. There used to be a great professor there named Gunther Klaus. He used to give a speech on price. It was one of the most motivating speeches you've ever heard in your life. But in the end, what he said is, that's not it. It has to be true value, something that is lasting, that will resonate with your consumers. And pomegranate is health in a bottle, and that was the value statement. Now, um, we also back this with tens of millions of dollars in peer-reviewed science. Charlie Rose asked me the other night, how can we trust your science? You paid for it. I said, Charlie, that's a really good question. But if we hadn't paid for it, nobody would have done it. And uh, now other people are also doing research on the pomegranate because it does so much for you. It is great for circulation. There isn't a man that shouldn't drink eight ounces a day or take the supplement because it really can uh, ward off the rise of the PSA, which is a marker for prostate cancer. And if you go to your urologist, they'll tell you the same thing. So we couldn't come out and make huge claims but we came up with a very funny advertising campaign. Have you seen the ads that Palm has done? Like, the bottle becomes a little person. And um, there's one with uh, the bottle and a noose around its neck, and it says, cheat death. That was one of my most um, fabulous billboards. <laughs> uh, and uh, with a hula hoop, uh, you know, for every young and things like that. So, and right now, uh, the bottle's become a superhero because we need superheroes in this economy, don't we? So that is what I did. I, I found the unique value and communicated the unique selling proposition with the antioxidant superpower, which is the message in Palm. And uh, we try to be totally transparent in what we do. So Palm Truth is another place you can go to find out all about our science and so forth. We can talk also... Well, let, let's talk about Fiji water next. Okay. Um, another, it's another interesting proposition because, as, as we heard in the introduction, there is a lot of water out there. There's the controversy about bottled water. People, some people revile it. The, there's the fact that this water came from halfway around the earth. How did, you, how did you handle all those challenges, all the criticisms of the industry, and, and boost sales the way you have? Besides well, the fact that it's delicious. Yes, it is. And there's a reason it's delicious. Do you feel like you're going to hear an ad now? <laughs> <laughs> you're right. I wrote that copy. I remember it. So the amazing thing is, when we bought Fiji water, I didn't want to buy Fiji water, because every time Stuart says we're going to buy something, I know who's going to do the work, right? So um, I said, all waters taste the same. He said, no, they don't. I said, prove it. So it was an aspen, and we had, we had just come back from a hike. I was really thirsty. And he put 20 bottled waters. It was, I was blindfolded. And I tasted them. I had these magic taste buds like Betty Grable's legs. Does anyone remember Betty Grable in this room? Please say yes. One person raise your hand. Okay, good. Okay. So I don't know why. It's just something I was born with. And I never knew that they were amazing until, you know, I started tasting products. So... Um, I picked the Fiji water, damn it, I did. And we bought the company. And the, the, name, the slogan for the company was a taste of paradise. What the heck does that mean? So I started doing research. That's the first thing you always do is your research. You have to be buttoned up. It doesn't come from outer space. It's, it comes from knowledge, you know. Once in a while you get those divine interventions, but you can't count on them. So I found out that Fiji water fell as rain 200 years ago into this underground aquifer in a volcano at the tip of, a, of the Fijian rainforest, the most pristine place on the planet. It fell before the Industrial Revolution into an underground aquifer, an active aquifer, and the only way to get the water out is to put a borehole down into the aquifer. The water comes up into hermetically sealed pipes directly into the bottle untouched by man until you drink it. And it's a sustainable resource. It's constantly being, it rains there a lot. I can tell you, I went there in a helicopter with the windows open, and I won the wet t-shirt contest <laughs> when I landed. It was something to behold. Anyway, um, so I realized the unique selling proposition and the true value of this water. And uh, our sales went up 300% when we, you know, we used the back label, uh, we have like 10 different back labels. We tell the story. I changed the front label. I didn't come up with a square bottle. That was the previous owner's because it packs better on the ship. 
you know, it's it's more resource. You know, it's better for the environment, a square bottle. And um, then I went to the Aspen Institute one summer, and this little whippersnapper was sitting on the stage drinking my water like a thirsty dog, and uh, putting down Fiji water. He had just done a blog on Google that said that it takes three quarters of a bottle of crude oil to bring a bottle of Fiji water from Fiji. Well, I knew that wasn't right. I'm not in the oil business. I'm in the water business, for God's sake. But I realized that I didn't know. And I care about the environment more than anybody, or as much as anybody. We've been on the board of Conservation International for years, and it's it, we really that's one of the main things that my husband and I care about. And I realized that I was so stupid that I... You know, you have to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. You really do, because you can learn a lot from people, even if they're against you. And so um, I came back immediately and had a research study done to find out what it was. And I found out it was a tablespoon, but that was still too much. And I said, listen, this thing is growing, and we have to do something, because I'm not going to be the problem. And, by the way, we are the largest selling premium water in America, but we only are uh, 2% of the entire water business. That's all we are. Hmm. Okay? So, uh, but be that as it may. So what we did is we came up, and you can go to FijiGreen.com and see all the things that we've gone through to reduce our carbon footprint. First of all, we measured our carbon footprint mm -hmm. from the place in China where the preforms are made all the way to the moment you pick this up in the store, okay? And you can watch our progress reducing our carbon footprint on FijiWater.com. We uh, bought back our carbon offsets, and the way we did it, 120%. So every time you pick up a bottle of Fiji, you're giving 20% back to the grid. But what we did, uh, we're replanting the uh, rainforest in Fiji. And the reason we're doing that is so much of the Fijian rainforest has been slashed and burned to grow sugarcane and to raise cattle. And so uh, we're trying to keep it pristine. We also saved the Sovi Basin in Fiji, which is 50,000 square miles of beautiful virgin uh, rainforest. And we reduced the plastic in the bottle. And we're uh, shipping through the Panama Canal instead of going and, and dropping off in California and trucking across the country. We're doing all sorts of things, putting in wind and solar, um, in an ever-ending attempt to uh, do it better. So that's... So you took, you took a, an existing brand, in this case, and sort of slightly altered the packaging. Not the packaging, but the... the labeling of it right right and, and then have done what you can to answer the, the every drop is green <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about telefloor because you just bought the first super bowl ad for a yes. floral company in anybody a say long it time yeah did you laugh yes. good <laughs> i won't ask you if you bought anything we can talk later <laughs> I like flowers in a box, though, but that's because I send myself flowers. I so. see. Are you surprised when you get home? Very surprised. Oh, my when God, I for me? <laughs> you shouldn't have. That was so nice. But it, it was a great ad. And here, I want to, someone on a blog I read said that um, there was a 14 164% increase in online mentions after that Super Bowl ad, which I guess justifies the millions of dollars that people spend on those things. But some other, there was some other controversy about it. I have to say it got a lot of people talking about Teleflora, even if it was in a negative way. Some people didn't like some of the things you, you said in the ad, and we can talk about that in a second. Um, worst Super Bowl ad still gets just as much attention as the best one and gets replayed over and over and over. When it comes to consumer impressions and the marketing and advertising sense, you can't beat that. You've, you haven't done the typical sorts of advertising in the past, and even with Teleflora, you've done these big TV shows where you sponsor, but, but not sort of conventional media. So why did you buy this ad, and how'd you make that particular ad, and how'd you We, we were it? drunk when we made this, <laughs> Jim. I have to be honest. We, <laughs> we, we take our um, uh, presidents and top uh, uh, management away every year for uh, a think tank, uh, and those were the good days. So that was uh, last year. We took everybody to Barcelona, and uh, we took over the Picasso Museum. And uh, we were, it was the last night of this wonderful meeting, and there were wonderful guitarists and 
wine and great food. And the CFO of the company had just seen the Teleflower presentation that afternoon. And he raised his hand and he said, we should buy a Super Bowl ad. And we were all had a lot of wine. And we said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> you know, and uh, even when we sobered up, we decided to do it. And we bought the ad early before the crash. Now, I have to tell you the truth. I don't know if I would have done it if it was after October. But I did it before I made a commitment. I wasn't going to back down on the commitment. And once we were in there, we decided to make it the best ad we could. It did wonders for our business. It really did. Our sales were up for Valentine's Day 10%, which in this economy, with the flower industry being down 15%, is really quite a miracle. And our sales today are up 32% after the holiday. So our name recognition, it really helped. But I can't take responsibility for it because... Actually, I probably would have backed out if I could have. But that's the way serendipity is. And yes, we had some complaints from women's groups because the flowers said nasty things. You know, don't send flowers in a box because you never know what they'll say. Well, you have to break through the clutter somehow. But if you had seen the outtakes of what some of those flowers said that I didn't put on the commercial, they really would have been on oh, Tell Just tell one. Oh, well, the one that they took uh, exception to when the flower said to her, nobody wants to see you naked. But, <laughs> but then the guy in the office that was secretly in love with her did want to see her naked. <laughs> but, um, oh, have you ever tried rhinoplasty? Or where'd you get those kegels? I didn't know what a kegel was. Uh, you know, all, all those kinds of things. But, you know, you have to break through the clutter somehow. And... Um, we thought that people should know that 60% of the flowers you order do come in a box. And sometimes you don't know that if you order them uh, on the Internet. And our flowers at Teleflower, our unique selling proposition, our value proposition, if you will, is that all the flowers come, they're designed by a local florist, one of our 20,000 local small business people, the lifeblood of America. And they're hand-delivered to the door, usually in a keepsake container. So uh, that's our difference, and that's why we chose that vehicle to, to tell. But usually we don't do that kind of advertising. I don't really believe in television advertising. But the Super Bowl, people watch it's the commercials. Yeah. Yeah. And today I'm going back to TV because you can buy it so reasonably. Uh, it's 30% um, of what it used to be to buy most media today. And like with Palm, we haven't reduced our budget accordingly. We're just buying that much more. Because if you have money to invest in media, boy, this is the time to do it. It really is. You can make a brand in this down economy. Let's talk about the down economy a little bit since it is the elephant in the room. And, and I want to maybe start talking about it because of the brands you've got. I mean, this stuff isn't cheap. It's good. It's not cheap. And the pomegranate juice ain't cheap either. And flowers are one of those things that, you know... They die. They die. You're not going to... Like you say, the in, you've already seen the industry take a hit. So what are you going to do in this crazy economy where the things you're selling are more expendable, perhaps, than, than others? Well, Palm's not expendable. <laughs> I mean, it, like we say in our uh, ads... Just because the economy's tanking doesn't mean your health has to. Our, our palm sales are very robust, and I think that's why. Fiji's flat, to tell you the truth, flat water, flat sales, um, because it is expensive, quite frankly. And uh, you can drink water out of the tap. You can buy Arrowhead, which is much less money and so forth and so on. It doesn't taste the same. It doesn't do the same things for you. It doesn't have the silica. It doesn't have the electrolytes. But, hey, it's water. Um, and I told you about Teleflar, but let me tell you what we're doing internally, and hopefully it'll help you. I am retooling all of my businesses. I really am. I, I tell the employees, look, we just landed on Mars, because we did. These Martians showed up in October right after the crash. They're different people than they were before. Um, they used to think about how much money they thought they had is what made them happy and how much they could buy. And now their purse strings are pulled tighter than Madonna's bustier, right? <laughs> um, so what do you do? You have to get into the minds of this new consumer. Are you relevant to their lives? If you are, find a new way to communicate that. How do you find out if, if you're relevant? What if you have a small business? You can go on Zoomerang. Do you know about Zoomerang? Zoomerang.com, for $20 a month, you can do a research study with your demographic group, with the age, level of education, 
male, female, whatever. You can test your ideas. What a godsend. It's fantastic. It used to cost so much money to do market research, but today it's almost free. If you work for someone, is your job relevant to what they're doing? If you have ideas for the company, take them to your boss. They'll be grateful. Really, they will. And if you're just graduating from school, um, the Anderson people, I don't know if you thought you were going into finance and now you're not, but try and find a company that is doing well or a, a, um, a type of firm that's doing well in spite of the economy. And also, if you can afford to, this is a great time to give back. I, I went to the TED conference recently. Did anybody go to TED here? Um, it's, it's a very, you know, it's high tech, uh, lots of nerdy billionaires. Um, <laughs> Al Gore spoke. You want to feel good about uh, the economy? Listen to what's going on with the environment. Boy, it just pales. Or listen to what Bill Gates said about AIDS in Africa or poverty all over the world. So there is so much need out there that if you can do something in the in the not-for-profit sector, this is such a good time to use your mind there. So what we're doing is really retooling. We're letting our consumers know that we understand their plight, and we're trying to make our messages more relevant. That's some of the things that we're doing today. Linda, not everybody is wired the way you are. And the way you've so craftily, artfully taken lemons and made lemonade, et cetera. Not everybody's wired to work for themselves. And yet, increasingly in this world, we have to be the brand called us. We have to do that. What do you, what do you tell people, especially the young people in the audience, but even us middle-aged people in the audience, how do you recommend that we retool the way we think, not to be in a corporation or even in a, another person's mm -hmm. employ? So how, how do I tell you to go out and do it on your own? You know, it all comes from believing in your own idea. You know, you have to really believe, but you also have to work hard. I tell you, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, was a really inspiration to me. I also found it extremely depressing. <laughs> 10,000 hours you have to give. Uh, to get ahead, but you know what? There's no shortcuts. I think of one of the reasons I did so well in my early 20s is because I started so young in my advertising business. And so I had my 10,000 hours by the time I was 22, you know? There's no shortcut for hard work. But even if you're working for someone else, you can still be an entrepreneur in what you're doing. I interviewed a young man the other day um, who really made an impression on me. He came in for the interview. We had a nice chat. A lot of the people in the uh, business liked him, so he was already recommended. And he said to me something that I have never heard in my life. He said, I wrote a mission statement about what I would do for your company. Now, I believe in mission statements. I run mission statement groups all the time for uh, my not-for-profits that I belong to and also for our company. And I thought, my God. And then he read it to me. I have to hire him. He totally got it. He said in one sentence what he would do for the company. Mm. So to be prepared when you go on a job interview or you pitch yourself to get a job from someone for your own business, be so prepared that you know everything about the place you're going that will impress them the most. It really will. Because people tried to take a shortcut. Our whole country took a shortcut for 20 years. Fancy derivatives, financial instruments, get rich quick. It's over. No get rich quick. You have to do your homework. But if you do, it'll pay off. And, and choosing something that you want to do as opposed have to, to have doing a passion. it because you of the You totally buck. have to have a passion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know how we're doing. I haven't heard the crickets yet. Are we okay on time? Okay, good. Um, I lost track of that. I, to that point, you, you're suggesting that we think creatively, but you also talk a lot in the book about how you don't like this phrase, thinking outside the box. Let's talk about why you think that's bunk. You've always heard, think outside the box. Don't think outside the box. Think inside the box. That's where the answer is. But what do you mean? 
The answer is within the problem itself. I remember one of the first campaigns, uh, we have an in-house advertising agency. We do everything in-house. We do PR in-house. Rob Six is here. He's the greatest communicate. Raise your hand, darling. You're such a star. Uh, we do product development in-house. We do it all. Um, one of the first campaigns the agency brought me for Palm was with Zen and borrowed interest and all kinds of, you know, really cute ideas, but nothing to do with the pomegranate. The answer lies within the product. If you can't find a way to communicate the unique selling proposition of that product and you have to hire borrowed interest, like Jennifer Aniston for tens of millions of dollars to sell smart water, you have a problem with your product. You know? They hired, um, what, what is her name, the pizza girl? Um, oh, you wrote about it. Uh, Je uh, Jessica Simpson. Right. To sell Domino's pizza. Then they found out she was allergic to wheat, allergic to tomatoes, <laughs> and allergic to cheese. You know? So that's why I never use celebrities to tout my brands. I always make the product the celebrity. And that's kind of an example of thinking inside the mm -hmm. box. Another thing you talk about in the book is that being a great marketer is like being a great friend. I thought that was interesting advice, too. Yes. Um, a great friend listens, is empathetic, and tries to help. And uh, that's what a great marketer does. And the third thing, besides value and unique selling proposition, that I talk about in the book is transparency and community especially in this 21st century. You have to be part of the fiber of your community. If it's your street, your city, or the whole planet, you have to give back. You, you really do. And you want to leave the planet better than you found it. And so um, that's a good friend, isn't it? Someone that gives back. And to that end, I'd like to say that of all the interesting things I've learned in researching being with you here today, your philanthropy is quite remarkable and very it must be very exciting for you to have done so well financially and be able to give so much back to the communities that you serve, especially with the LACMA gift that you made, I guess, late last year. And another thing, uh, you write a column on the Huffington Post and talked about how it's hard for you to imagine going to buy a pair of shoes on Rodeo Drive at a time when many people don't have enough to eat. That really, that was really moving to me and I just wanted to share it with everybody but I wanted to hear a little bit more about what you had to say because we all face that in our lives every day. All of us who are here are fortunate to an extent or another. How do we calibrate that with what's going on in the world around us? It probably is the service that you're talking about that the President has talked about. But Yes, isn't that wonderful that he's talking about giving back? And um, uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I thought you wanted to, me to talk about my fashion philosophy. <laughs> no. I'm sure that's okay, too. Target. <laughs> right. Target. Target. Yes, yes. Um, well, uh, one of the things we do at Roll, uh, which is the parent company that owns all these other companies, is uh, that we give $1,000 a year to each employee to give to any charity that they choose, any 501c3. We won't pay for Uncle Harry's hernia operation. But as long as it's, uh, and not political, because unless, of course, they would give it to what I believe in. <laughs> that's not good to push that. So uh, that's been wonderful. Now we're going to build a, um, a house, a Habitat for Humanity. We're going to build a house, which I'm really excited about. With your employees. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And so uh, that's, that. Is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and um, we hope that by doing this, we inspire people and let them know how good it makes us feel to give back. Uh, most of our charitable giving, I mean, you might hear about LACMA and UCLA and things like that, but what we do mostly is in the Central Valley because we are the largest employer in the Central Valley of California. And so um, we, uh, we just built a preschool that is LEED Platinum. I'm so proud of it. I wish I had been able to go to that school. I wanted to stay. It's just fabulous. And uh, we're building a charter school up there, and we uh, build a children's hospital, and we send um, any child whose parent goes to, uh, works for us, if they get over a 2.8 average, we'll send them to college. So that's what we're doing. And that's why I work. Awesome. What's the biggest mistake you've made? Wow. 
I've made so many, it's hard to choose. Um, I, I don't know. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, and of course I continue to make them. And as I said the other night on Charlie Rose, make them early. They're less expensive. Uh, but the biggest mistake, I don't know, I think maybe making um, a quick judgment on people before I take the time to get to know them is a mistake that I try not to make. I try to stay open. Um, I will tell you, when you do make mistakes and you think back, you know that it's, it's a judgment in your own character. It's something that you have to work on. Um, because that's really where the mistakes lie. You know, I always find that if it's a choice between two people uh, that I have to hire, I try to hire the one that seems the most healthy. <laughs> because the healthier you are, and uh, as an individual, uh, and I think the more spiritual you are, the better you are at not making mistakes. And so I pray for that every day, if you will. I hope it doesn't s seem too soppy, but I really do. I, I pray for compassion, and I, I really pray that I am open so that I, you know, can be a better leader. I think we all do in some way. Um, in, in terms of publicly traded companies, not to have a heavy-handed transition there, but I wanted to make sure we talked about that too because you again in the book talk a lot about why publicly traded companies are bad and I think we all have plenty of evidence of why that's, why there's suspicion, no offense to anybody who works for one, but let's, let's talk about well, that. Well, they're not all bad, certainly. They're not all bad. No. But why you're less inclined to hire someone from a publicly traded company? Well, from the financial. Uh, well, we, we had, and this is hysterical, uh, we hired a, um, a CFO for one of our companies that had just come straight from Wall Street, and he was cooking the books. But, I mean, he couldn't help it. It was a tick. And uh, the, the um, I mean, he was trying to put the accounting in a good light. And the guy that was the president of this particular division kept saying, hey, we own this company. We need to know the truth. We finally had to let him go. But it is the tyranny of instant gratification that Wall Street promotes or had promoted up until now. It is that the quarterly earnings have to look good. And they didn't run companies for the long term. And that's why we are so grateful that we are privately held. Because when we make a decision, it may not make money immediately, but eventually, look, we, we put in over $110 million in uh, Palm before we saw a dime. Well, that would have been hard to do at a, uh, at a Wall Street company, wouldn't it? A Fortune 500 company. What do you think you're doing? Nobody ever heard of this fruit, and you're going to put all this investment in, and blah, blah, blah. And so they would immediately have taken the short-term uh, road, which we don't do. So that's the reason. But hopefully, uh, Wall Street's going to get a conscience now, and uh, they will do it differently. I hope. I pray. So we're not going to see Nestle or Procter & Gamble swoop in and steal these brands from you, buy these brands from you anytime oh, soon. No, no, no. no. Uh-uh. No. We're still okay? Or we're getting close to ask it. Is everybody ready to ask a question? Because I've got plenty more, but I'm hogging the floor here. So anybody? Don't be shy. Libby will be around with a microphone if you have a question. Lady, Just raise your hand. Yes, lady right up here. Wait just one second for the mic, please. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joyce Cressa, and we're delighted to be here and listen to you. How do you handle the um, packaging with all the environmental things that are going on with the plastic bottles, what are you doing about that? Yes. Now, you can go to the Fiji website and talk and hear about the plastic. This plastic that's in the water bottles in America is not going to hurt you. There, there is nothing dangerous about this plastic. I promise you, really. Um, the thing that you don't want to do is buy Coca-Cola in India um, because they use recycled uh, plastic that can leach uh, from the bottle into the soda and things like that. So, so there are dangerous plastics out there, but this is perfectly safe. And you switched I, palm to, excuse me, to, from glass to plastic yes. too to save. Well, both we money. changed uh, to plastic because well, I had to do glass in the beginning because nobody could make the bottle. Right. You know, I always pick a bottle nobody can make. So, um, 
uh, then we taught the uh, plastics industry how to make the bottle. But the bottle's so much lighter. There we go. There we go. The bottle is, <laughs> a plastic bottle is lighter, and it's much better for the environment because glass uh, has to be shipped from wherever it's made to the bottler. Then they have to clean it with solvents that are bad for the environment. And in the case of water, they're cleaning it with more, twice as much or three times as much water as they're going to put in, so you're wasting all the water. And it, it's just much better to use plastic, safe plastic. <laughs> I want to make sure I ask you about the Pentagon Papers, too. Oh, gee. Good morning. My name is Jackie Nagel. It's a pleasure to hear you speak. And, Thank you know, you. as uh, the accolades were being read, one of the first questions that came to my mind as being an entrepreneur, how did you manage to accomplish um, so much in so many different industries in such a short period of time? It doesn't seem like a short period of time for oh. me. <laughs> I'm a lot older than you think. <laughs> My granddaughter's 17. She's going to Bard this year. Um, or maybe you didn't think I was. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I just point myself in the direction and start. Um, you know, I was at Teleflora for a long time, then moved over to the Franklin Mint, was there for 16 years, and then uh, all these packaged goods. But the basic tenets of good marketing work everywhere. They really do, and my career is a testimony to that. And I didn't know anything about food uh, when I started taking over the commodities that we uh, were growing. And I learned quickly. And I think the fact that I went into an industry where I didn't know anything kept me from having all those old axioms to lean back on because they kept telling me, you can't do that. Oh, oh no, you can't do that. No, no, no. And you know what? We did. So... Sometimes it's good not to know. What you sold at the Franklin Mint, being in the tchotchke business, must be very different. Not that they're tchotchkes, they're a little bit higher end than that. But, I but like the, to think so. It's very different than selling a commodity. But it is, at the end of the day, it's all basically the same thing. Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, I was as passionate about my Franklin Mint products as I am about the products we have now. And um, every detail of every doll... You know, every die-cast car, I mean, I poured over those things. And um, I had 8 million collectors around the planet, and they loved them. I brought joy to people's lives. I mean, it was a big high. It was like working in Santa's workshop. It really was. It was great. And so if you believe in... There was a pussycat plate that I have to tell you about. I wasn't so hot on. <laughs> but uh, the rest of it was pretty near and dear to me, so... The Jackie O. Pearls yes. is a good story. I didn't remember it until I read it. Yeah. Maybe you should tell it how you bid... Lots they, of money. Yes, we paid 211000 for a strand of fake pearls. Um, yeah, but uh, you read the book, you'll see. It worked out very well because we so, that gave us the right to sell the copies. And today, if you want to see the Jackie Pearls, I gave them back to the nation, and they're at the Smithsonian. Yeah. Another question here. I can probably just talk about <laughs> Michelle Graves. Thank you so much uh, for coming in. From My pleasure. partners, whether it's retail to get them to put the juice in, in a non-obvious place or bar and restaurant convincing them to buy square water holders, etc. How do you get other people to come along Great for the question. ride? Great question. Great question. So uh, let me tell you what we did at Palm. You know, all the marketing uh, geniuses that uh, told me, uh, you know, that they wanted to mix the juice, you know, that those fellows, they said nobody will ever... Uh, look for juice in the produce section. Nobody will ever pay $3.50 for a bottle of juice, and guys will not buy juice with a heart on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, that only made me want to do it more. What, this is what we did. We went to the heads of all the chains. We fed them the juice. We showed them the science. They all bought it. Every single chain. We have 90% ACV for Palm, and we had it almost a year after we were out. And we also had a sales manager who took it personally if anyone turned him down. I swear to God, this guy's resume dropped on my desk one day. We were desperate to find somebody fabulous. And he had been with Tropicana, so he came from the juice business. He looked like Superman. I mean, there was no way we weren't going to hire this guy. And he opened up every store in America. So that's the way we did it. Now, a lot of restaurants don't want to serve Fiji because it comes in a plastic bottle. But 
I didn't come up with the silver holders. That was uh, David Gilmore, the guy we bought the company from uh, three and a half, four years ago. But still, it has made a huge difference in getting it sold into the high-end things. But that's what we do. We go to the top. And we talk them into it because if, then eventually you have to sell each department manager and so forth. But if they get a little note from the president, it can be encouraging. <laughs> we had this gentleman here. Since we haven't had a gentleman caller yet, let's have him. Hi, I'm Guru. I work for a nonprofit. We try to make uh, engineers and scientists out of uh, underserved children in the LA community. Um, so my question is, you talk about taking the, uh, the rough road, you know, not taking shortcuts, but it seems like often that this involves a lot of, uh, you know, financial expenditure. And for, for a nonprofit, you know, starting off in this day and age when funding is scarce, like, I believe in branding, but that involves money. So if you don't have that money, where do you get, where do you go to get this brand from? Good question. Okay, great question. We have a gift today that the Depression didn't have don't we? We have the internet. Okay. So being a not-for-profit, I'm sure that you can, what you're doing sounds absolutely fabulous. That you can find someone, some brilliant tech person that's willing to do the SEO on your website. Do, do you have um, a website? Okay. SEO, search engine, engine optimization. That's right. That will be your key. Search engine optimization is the way that your site is written. Uh, so that the Googles of the world pick up the keywords in your website and you start showing up in natural search, okay? Um, the other thing you can do is you can buy keywords. They're not expensive for what you're doing. So um, turning engineer, you know, so, you know what the keywords are, uh, the buzzwords and what you're doing. Look into that. Maybe you'll find an angel that will help you uh, bid on those keywords. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, go and speak to groups that are interested in the sort of thing you're doing. You can, you can sign up for Google or Technorati. It's free to get all the blogs and all the places that the sort of charity that you're doing, the not-for-profit that you're doing, that kind of information shows up. You enter yourself into that blog sphere. You become part of that conversation. You wait and see when you find people that are in a position of strength that can help you. Make them your ambassadors. And those are some of the things that you can do. That's like free PR. And um, just make sure that you find the movers and shakers in your community that are interested in this sort of thing and find a way uh, to get through to them in a creative way if you can. Does that help? Have you done some of that stuff? Yeah, we I mean, I just started working. All right, SEO is magic. I will tell you, the Teleflora, a few months before we started the SEO, was 67th in natural search, and now we're three because of our SEO. Now, we have competitors that are very hungry, and they're constantly after us. But still, with what you're doing, it will really help you. Um, we're back there. How would a nonprofit get somebody like yourself to become involved? What are some selling points, and what are some things that nonprofits approached you with that made you really interested in the organizations? You know, uh, we have a foundation, but we also have a mission statement. And so um, we are very careful now uh, about what we give to. It has to fit the mission. And our missions are the Central Valley is number one, Fiji, the people in Fiji, uh, number two, um, education, but especially around those areas, um, mental health, and the environment pretty much that's what we do. We have found that we have to focus, especially in this economy. Now, we've given a huge gift to the arts, and we continue to support the arts with, with uh, bringing the arts into the schools in the Central Valley. But if, I, if it's not part of that mission, you know, I just, I don't. So that's what you try to do, find out what the mission is of the charities, and you find the ones that align with what you're doing, and you'll have a much better chance.
And inverse, inversely, the charity needs to find the people who are the logical right. people to right. court. But what you could do, what all of you can do, is to call Joel Epstein, he'll kill me for this, <laughs> at uh, Roll International or email him at roll.com um, and tell him what your charity is. And we, if it fits, we could let you come in and pitch the Roll family of companies or appear on our website. So we do that so that the people at Roll can give because they're free to do what they like, you know? While you're there, can you go back? Oh, sorry. Us. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh. Next time, I promise, we'll get over there. So when you're hiring people, how do you recognize great ability? What's your strategy for recognizing that? And yeah, like I said, being prepared. Really being prepared, knowing about the company, having some ideas, but not like a know-it-all. But just asking, have you thought of this, have you thought of that? But not when you first walk in the room. Uh, that's, that's the way, you know, uh, to, to do well on an interview, I believe, is to really show an interest in the company and show that you've done your homework, that you've read the articles about them, you've Googled them to death, and you, and you know all about what they're doing. That will impress people the most. You'd be surprised how many people come in and don't know, even when they see the president. It's interesting. Here. Sorry, my Thank you. Um, with the other players in the floral, floral industry hurting, you're definitely the most powerful person in the floral industry right now. And it seems that with Teleflora, you have two kinds of products. You have plants which respirate and help with global warming every molecule. And you've got flowers which are flown in from Latin America or from South America and then last for four or five days and then start producing a lot of methane. Do you have any thoughts or plans about ways to address that issue as you've been so responsible with Fiji water? Um, we are aware of this. Um, our flowers, uh, the ones that you buy in the box are the ones that came from so far away. You know, we don't buy directly. We promote flowers, but we don't grow them. And we don't really sell them. We have a small little company, Stems and Bunches. But you're right, it is a big carbon footprint. But hopefully they last at least a week, you know. But it is, you're right. I can't say that it isn't. The plants are a service that we do. We don't sell as many plants. Basically, we sell flowers in a gift. But think of what it's doing for the small business people. It is a wonderful job, and there's 20,000 of them. So there's good coming out of it, too. And it brings so much joy to people. And don't eat the steak next time. You know what that carbon footprint is? 16 big bottles of Fiji water. Just living is a carbon footprint. All right, let's do one, one more question. Yeah, if this gentleman right here, thanks. Sure. Uh, just, just wait one sec, please. Thanks. Just a follow-up question, I guess, on the uh, plastic bottles. I understand that you've uh, offset the carbon footprint and you're using safe plastics, but kind of the reality is most of these bottles still end up in a landfill. Um, has Fiji considered using uh, corn-based plastics into, into the new uh, packaging? Yes, we did. We certainly did, of course. Um, and the problem is that the bottle disintegrates before the shelf life of the water is over. So you uh, open your cupboard, and there's a little puddle there of your... Um, the problem in America is recycling. Okay, that's the problem. In the states that give the money back, the recycling is fantastic, like 95%. And New York is now struggling to get that bill passed, and I pray that they do. I, for one, would be thrilled to give the money back to the consumer, but we have two, you know, we have Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and they're fighting it tooth and nail. I think the Nestle people would go along with us. I think that they're very environmentally aware. But if before I went on the book tour, I was going to go on the recycling tour to Congress because it's something I really believe in, and I may end up doing that if I... Um, so just buy my book so I can go back to work, okay? <laughs> um, 
But that's really what we have to do. We have to push for recycling laws. And, and you should know, though, that the entire bottled water industry is one-third of one percent, one-third of one percent of the landfill. Be that as it may, we wish it was nothing. And if there was a way to have a bottle where I could just bring the hose right into your mouth, I would do it. <laughs> I promise you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming this morning. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. And thank you, Lisa.